Erica Asante. Welcome to the Melati Jali Project Conversations. My name is Louisa Ivaze. I put together this um, podcast to celebrate diversity in children's storytelling and representation. Um, a bit about me, I am a writer. I write for adults and children. And my newest book with uh, Crowning Glory, we just got to award, won two awards, so I'm still very excited about that. And I'm, and I'm also the founder of the Ottawa Black Book Club, where we just meet to discuss books by writers of Black and African origin, because our goal is to decolonize bookshelves, melanate bookshelves, and just teach people about the Black experience. So welcome once again to our conversa- our Melanie Jolly uh, Project Conversations. So today we'll be discussing your, your newest book, Threads of Me, Kenting for Show and Tell. So when I saw this book, because I'm usually online, you know, just looking around, looking for books, and I saw this and I'm like, hmm, Kenting for Show and Tell. I had actually written a book about, a manuscript about fabric. And I was just curious, mm. hmm, what is Erica talking about? And then I read the book and I fell in love with it because what I, I like the authenticity. Kente, I've been to Accra twice. I'm Nigerian, you can mm-hmm. tell from my accent, yes. And I remember when I moved to Canada, I, I struggled with being understood. And I said, you know, for this reason, I, to maintain my authenticity, I'm going to keep my accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh yes, oh yes. So I am unapologetically West African Nigerian. So anytime you hear me speak, people go, "Ooh, that's a lovely accent." Where are you from? And I go, Nigeria. <laughs> Omo Niger. Omo Niger. Where they carry last. So I had never attributed royal significance to Kente because I visited Accra as a tourist and was fascinated by the fabric. And then when I read about it here, I did my little research and I went, ooh, okay. I like the origin of uh, the Kente, you know, where he spoke about it was inspired by a spider's web. And then the, uh, the, the link with royalty. So for me, I want to start by asking you, what inspired you to write this story? Yeah, um, the st- what inspired me to write is a bit different than what inspired me to write specifically this story. Uh, and so during the pandemic, we were home and my son was uh, schooling at home. And so his teacher asked the class, you know, what are your favorite foods? So each student had to respond. And he was like, oh, mommy, mommy, I want to tell them that my favorite food is a mutual in and cut and quine, which is rice balls and peanut butter soup. But they don't know what it is. And I said, okay, um, well, just tell them what it is you know because if you don't tell them they're never going to know anyway he opted to say pizza out of being comfortable yeah because he felt probably that they would know what it is and maybe there's some other sentiments that he had um but afterwards i told him that he doesn't have to do that not everybody knows everything and you sometimes have to tell people teach some people something about who you are your culture and then they will know so that's what led me to write. And I could have wrote, written about, you know, the peanut butter soup and the rice ball, but I did chose to write about Kente. The idea of show and tell is based off of his class and being willing and able and proud to show a part of your culture. But writing specifically about Kente came about, I really struggled initially to write a book you know, I just tried to come up with different ideas, but this came about because of the strength, in my opinion, of Kente. The fact that Kente has crossed over the borders of Ghana uh, and it's become very significant, actually across the world, and specifically in the United States for African Americans. I also see Kente being used in movies, um, in Black Panther, the first one it was used. Uh, I've seen it on the cover of Vogue. Amanda Gorman wore Kente inspired the cloth and not the actual hand woven Kente. Uh, and then you see it in movies. I've seen it in Nigerian movies. I've seen it in, Ken- in Kenyan movies um, being used in people's clothes and in bags and things of that nature. Um, so I just felt like this is something that people are wearing all the time. We see it, 
all the time. Um, we've seen it in, in several instances, but do people know the power and the meaning behind it? And that is what led me to write specifically about Kinti. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So the connection to folklore is what I find fascinating because I, mm -hmm. I heard about, I just, I read the story. You see, an Anansi, is something that was is, a, is someone that was introduced to me as a child. I read this book in secondary school, Children of Anansi by Peggy Appiah. So that's how many of mm -hmm. us. Yes, it's a collection of short stories. I read it in secondary in secondary school, GSS one. So it's a lot of us. That's how we were in, in Nigeria. We're introduced to Anansi, but I know that Anansi right. is popular. I now realize that Anansi is the same as Gizo in northern Nigeria. Oh, okay. I don't know if you speak Hausa. I know in some parts of Ghana they speak Hausa. Okay. No, I don't. Okay. So Anansi is the same as it's also Gizo because sometimes Anansi is depicted as a spider or a tortoise. That's what I've realized. But oh, okay. Yes, yes. In many, yeah, in different stories. Sometimes you see Anansi. Oh, Anansi is a spider. Yeah. Sometimes it's a tortoise. But I know that he, he, Anansi is someone with a lot of wisdom. Yes, yes, and a trickster. Yes, the trickster. Okay, you oh you call him a trickster, but I choose to call him someone with great wisdom because he is always up to something. Anansi doesn't give you yes. something for that's you. the trickster. That's, that's the trickster. Yes. Yeah. So please, I don't know. I would like you to tell the folklore of you know the origin of Kinte because I read about it, but since you wrote about this, you know what version did you read about? What version do you yeah. Have? Yes, that's yeah. amazing. So the, the folklore the folklore piece, the, the legend piece, yes, is the Anansi piece. The fact that there were two hunters. Um, some say that they were brothers, some say they were just two, I guess, friends or men uh, that went into the forest to hunt and saw this spider and observed the spider weaving the web and were just so intrigued by that them weaving and decided to replicate exactly what the spider was doing and that is how Kente came to be. So they used an olden day loom at the time or whatever they, they may have used at the time to do the same movements, using the same movements as the spider and that is what created a uh, Kente. And I understand that the first Kente was not very colorful. It was probably black and white or just some brown, plain colors. But as time went on, uh, these colors have been introduced. And even in, you know, my lifetime, I have just seen Kente even transform uh, completely. In a recent trip to Ghana, I just saw the different varieties of Kente. And sometimes you'll look at something and say, is that Kente? You may not be able to even see, but yes, Kente has changed so much. So that that is the folklore piece of it, the legend piece of it. Um, and Anansi, I know, is also very popular in the Caribbean. Uh, and in tree or Akan, should I say Akan, Anansi means spider. So it actually means spider in our language. Oh, really? Yeah, Anansi actually means spider in the Akan language uh, in Ghana, which is one of many languages spoken in Ghana. In Ghana, okay. Because I know that um, I was talking to a, a friend from the Caribbean and she was talking of Anansi. And when she said, mm -hmm. oh, we have Anansi, because she was just saying to me, oh, she would like to trace her family history. And I just mm -hmm. asked her, and the first question I asked her was, do you guys have old stories that have been passed down through generations in the family? And she said, yes, she remembers they always talk about Anansi. And when she said Anansi, I said, then your ancestry probably is West Africa and Ghanaian because I'm from West Africa and Ghana is just two countries away from us and yes. we don't have Anansi. We have Gizu in the north. Anansi mm. is Ghana. So I think you should mm. be looking that way. <laughs> yeah, you should be looking that way. So your ancestors must have been taken from there, you know, across the ocean to the Caribbean. So she went, oh, I never thought of that. I said, yeah, so now I've told you. Yeah, so because I'm just looking at the popular legend, I made some notes and I because I was just curious about the, the people who were these men, who were these friends or brothers that encountered Anansi. And yeah, are, I don't know. They, yes, I actually came across names. Uh Otta yes. Karaba Otta Karaba and his friend Kwaku Ameyao. Uh, Ameyao, yeah. Yeah, yes. so you know, I went to Ghana and I spoke to some of the weavers, okay. the people who actually weave the kente, and they ended up telling me the same story because, okay. I mean, 
even though, yes, it's a story for children, it doesn't have to be 100%, you know, factual, um, you know, but I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing any disservice specifically to the legend. Um, and there was, I think, one piece that I added actually to the folklore, <laughs> and that was the fact that I mean, that is my addition. It's only the only addition is really that, you know, there was an exchange of food. Um, so basically that Anansi wanted some of their food in exchange for, for showing them. And that is not part of any folklore that I have or legend that I have read. And that was the only piece I added. And then I even asked, you know, a few people, some of the weavers, is that okay for me to ask? <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's fine, it's fine. It's your story. Okay, oh, yeah. it's like asking for permission from the ancestors to do things. Yeah, I just wanted to just <laughs> have to buy them. Yeah. Because when I was reading uh, about it, it said that um, Anansi asked, uh, you know, he when they asked him to teach them because um, they were amazed by observing the beautiful, unique design and how it sparkled in the moonlight. So Anansi asked them for a favor they, in, in return. So it could have been. Food. I don't know what the favor was. Yeah. yeah. Because remember, they went to check their traps. So bushmeat, antelope. So it's food. Yeah, it makes They're sense. Alive. Okay, then. They're alive. <laughs> I just know Anansi wouldn't do it for free. So I said, yeah, Anansi would, would get food. It would get food. <laughs> so let me see. Yeah. So because let me see. Uh, page. Let me see. Okay. Yeah. You said uh, when they returned home, they imitated the dance of the spider using a loom. And that is how Kente came to be. In those days, the Asante, the Asantehene, how is that pronounced? Asantehene. 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 Okay. So that is the, the, the king of the Asante kingdom, uh, which is cu currently the Ashanti region and the Asante people who, I mean, live all over Ghana, but I mean, their home base, we say, is the Asante region. Shanti yeah. region. Yeah, in those days, the Asante Hene only allowed royals to wear kente, but now it is worn by people all over the world. And that is yes. very true. What I like about yes. kente is its authenticity. Wherever you see it, even if the colors are changed, it takes yes. you, you just go, this is African. This is West African. There is something powerful. very powerful about it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Very, very powerful about it. We have, I'm um, from, I am from Southern Nigeria. And we have something similar to the kente, which we call the we call the ipu. And wherever oh. you see it, yes, the patterns have the, the stripes are similar, but it doesn't mm. have patterns are a little bit. But it still is very very it's like similar to kente. But anywhere you see it, you know that this mm -hmm. is an Ishan, not even just Edo. This is an Ishan cloth. Yeah. 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 So let me go, let me continue one by, and then the naming of the fabric, I found out yeah. fascinating. What was that about? What's that about? Yes. Yeah, so as a everyday person, I cannot look at a kente and say, oh, this kente means that. Okay. Um, but the reason why I wanted to bring that into the story, the reason why I thought that was important is because as we are wearing um kente as we are seeing kente it's so beautiful like i love kente it's just stunning it's used for in, uh, traditional weddings in ghana or people some people call it the engagements and things um it's worn you know for celebration there's also uh, a type that's also can be worn for funerals and so forth um but it's generally just so beautiful and so colorful uh and i wanted people to know the power of it and part of the power of it is not just its beauty but it's the meanings that it holds the fact that you're wearing something that may have such a, a strong meaning and that name is not given by any just any person is given by the one who weaves the cloth uh, and so i think that that is important um that we understand that we are carrying something that we have something that is part of you know our cultures that is so powerful yeah, and I like how you did, I like how you brought family into it, where you said, Amap impatiently waited as Nana opened the box. Inside was the most colorful and majestic kente. This kente has been in our family for many generations. It was passed down to me by my Nana, her Nana passed it to her, and now I pass it on to you. I found that, I found that very beautiful, because in Nigeria, I think in other African, because I came across this book by another um, Ghanaian author, 
you know how when you leave home you go off to secondary school your mom always gives you this wrapper there's this cover cloth she gives you they have heard yes okay so there's this cover cloth what it actually is is just yeah you have your duvet but it's in nigeria yes you cover yourself mm-hmm. you come in here because of the weather difference and it's cold i think it's a way of giving you a piece of her yeah when you just yes. said it I, I yeah that makes a lot of sense wow yes. it's yes i feel that it's giving you a piece of her to go with you so for me here i saw that as in the family co- the family connection and then the name where he said in uh, if every kente has Amma, okay. If every kente has a name and a meaning, what is this one called and what does it mean? Amma asked. In Akan, it is called Abuswa Yedo. Did I say that right? Abuswa Yedo. Yes. Abuswa Yedo, which means the extended family is a force. It reminds us that family is important and it is up to us to take care of each other. I think that's, yeah. that, that's amazing. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. How important do you think it is for we as Africans to tell our authentic stories? Oh, um, it, it, it's key that Africans and Black people as a whole across the diaspora tell the, their authentic story because for so long, someone else has been telling the story. And one of the things is, you know, as I was on this author journey, sometimes they tell you, you have to pick kind of what kind of books you want to write. I was like, oh, well, I want to write about, you know, I want to expose children to the world. But every time I thought of a story, most of the time comes back to an African focused or related story. The reason is because I kept thinking, where do we see authentic, where do children see authentic African stories? Most of the stories that I have seen, or many of the stories that children will read or see, even I see my children, sometimes pick up a book or watch something on TV, if it's related to Africa, it's only related to giraffes and elephants, jungle and things. Yeah, yeah. And it's I can't, I haven't I have seen a, one show I forgot the name of it then I see like okay they're trying to expose children to different parts of like you know Africa and different aspects of culture and environment and things but it's kind of not all, all that common so the average child is probably going to associate anything with Africa first with animals the problem animals do live there yes. uh, in Africa and they live in certain parts more than maybe others but you know there's so much more to the continents, uh, you know, I believe it's 57 countries, maybe now it's more, but I believe it's 57 countries, you know, there, there's so much more. And so I think it's important to get those stories out there to expose children and even adults to the, the, the full truth, the full picture of what Africa is and the fact that it's so diverse, we're so different from one another, very similar in, in, in some aspects. And the truth of the matter is because of the negative portrayal of the Africa, um, many children and many people, adults and children like, do not want to be associated with Africa for that reason. Very true. So, a child maybe who was born in Canada or the UK or Germany or US to parents that were born in another country may not actually want to associate with Africa because generally portrayal has been negative. Famine, corruption, poverty, war. Unless maybe that child, which rarely is getting exposure to Instagram. On Instagram, I see so many different cultures. I learn things from different cultures because the people themselves sometimes are the ones telling the story. Like I look at a lot of uh, things about Native Americans, very interested in Native American culture and history. And sometimes it's the Native Americans that themselves that are telling their story. And you get to learn more about their culture, about their experience, about everyday life. It's just a snippet, snippet but it's something, it's a piece. And so I think it's, it's key and important and there's a need for more of such stories so that people can learn um, to instill pride for people to be able to to be willing and wanting to embrace their culture um, or or a culture that is part of them. And so I think that that's key. Yeah, I think it's very important. If I think of growing up back in Nigeria, the early literature I was introduced to because I've always been a Mm -hmm. reader where was enlightened. 
I grew up reading the Innie Blightons. I read Mallory Towers. My first, I think the first time I came across African focused books was in high school. There were this a series called Pace Setters. Yeah. So, yeah, so that way, yeah, it was so it I think it was done, it was put together by Heine, Heineman books. But there were these books by Pace Setters that you know that had African characters from different parts of Africa. And I remember my dream then was once I finish secondary school, I'm going to write for them. But by the time I graduated, I finished secondary school, the books were out of print. So they had stopped printing, they had stopped, you know, and I went, okay. And then the search started. Where can I find African, you know, African-centered stories, apart from folklore? So Children of Anansi was, it was very, it was great to have Children of Anansi. But I did my research recently on Peggy Appiah because I was just curious about her. And I realized she was a white, she was a white English woman married to And I went, mm, yes. okay. <laughs> I mean, people of other races and culture can write about other cultures, but I think it's a very thin line. It's a very, very thin line. And it's unfortunate that many, that the early stories we had about different cultures were written by different people. In fact, I, like, I, I would say that we had the colonized version of a lot of African stories, which was, I feel, to some extent, a misrepresentation of those cultures. Because when I was growing up, there was a time it was cool to have English names. You just keep your English names. Yeah. But what I'm yeah, loving now about being Nigerian is everybody now is owning it. You will meet Excellent. Nigerians born maybe in the US, in Canada, and you go, oh, where are you from? And they go, well, I was, I'm Nigerian, but I was born here. You know, the, first of all, they want to identify. I am Nigerian and I was born here. My adult novels, I try to promote p- pidgin English. Because yes, we speak the British English, but there is something called Pidgin English in West yeah. African cultures. And when I thought of writing children's books, I went, okay, what do I write about? And I went, you know what? I'm a history junkie. I love history. So why not educate children about Africa through great stories? I reached out to publishers and I just couldn't find a publisher willing to publish my work. So I went, okay. Let me go back to the drawing board, took a look at it, reached out to a writing consultant. She said, okay, your word count is too much. The book is too long, 5,000 words. You can't keep a child's attention. I went, okay. Then I reached out to an editor from one of these big publishing houses. And she was honest enough with me to say, yes, even though we are asking for diverse stories, we want Canada focused stories. And I'm, I went, okay. So how do I tell an authentic West African story set in Canada? Because, yes, I agree that publishing is a business because they too have to, they too are looking for what they can sell. But again, how do we tell authentic, how do we keep the authenticity of our stories while thinking of the business aspect of publishing? Because yeah. when we publish books, we want our books to sell. And I remember when I was reading um, your was it dedication but when you put out when you put this book out i remember i read one of your comments you said you worked with there were two ladies and you didn't go the kickstarter way oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, i was going to ask you about that because kickstarter is something i have thought of doing because a lot of writers uh-huh. have struggled with getting published by big houses big publishing yeah. houses so some of them go the, the Kickstarter route, some do the go self-publishing route. So please speak to me about that. Tell me about that. What was your yeah. what was your journey? Yeah. So you know, I actually did a little bit of research between the traditional publishing and then being self-published. And the reason, at least I can say for this book, the reason why I chose initially to go the self-publishing route was because I didn't want any change or any difference to the story. And I wanted to choose the illustrator specifically for this book. I wanted no change at all. And that's the reason I chose that route. Um, Not doing Kickstarter was a, it was a rough time because my father had passed away around the time that I was about to do a Kickstarter. My father passed away this year. And so that, I just wasn't in the right mental state to take on the stress 
of doing the Kickstarter. And I wanted to do, you know, things really at my own pace. So that's what led me not to do uh, the Kickstarter. So I have funded every aspect of the book with the exception of a donation, $500 that was given to me by someone who I was trying to work with and just turned, she said she couldn't work with me um, because she didn't feel she was the right person and then just sent $500. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's like, well, <laughs> so yeah, but yes, it has been funded by, you know, by my household, my husband and I, from the beginning to the end. And that is the reason. However, honestly, I do not count out traditional publishing and I didn't try. Uh, and it's something right now as we're speaking that I'm thinking about. Because one thing I realize is that when you are doing anything, going for a job or anything of that sort, finding a publishing company, an agent, you are interviewing the individual or the company just as much as they are interviewing you. So there are going to be publishers, there are going to be agents that may be interested in your work, but you have to ask the right questions and figure out, is this the kind of company you want to work with? And find out what kind of creative control at all do you have? What do they bring to the table? Um, and you know, they're gonna ask you as well, what are you bringing to the table? And so, and, and I don't, I, I'm not against traditional publishing at all, um, but that was the reason I took this route. Because how do you think that as diverse authors we can get our books out there? Because I feel that we somehow we should come together. We should come together to support each other. Just... Yeah, because that exactly. is for me, that is okay. So for me, that is why I'm doing this. How or the other, we need to come together. But how do you think we can do that? Because I'm in Canada, you are in the US. Oh. Yes. The, the distance doesn't make any difference as we have seen from pandemic. That's to me irrelevant. Um, and I've seen other authors come together in different ways. I've seen them promote their books together under specific themes um, and try to pr promote them uh, for, for different purposes. Uh, I think there are some, I saw a consortium of people that have come together and they're various authors that are bringing their books and promoting their books to school districts. So they'll take all their books and write a, a nice letter and then basically offer the list of books to the school districts uh, and present that to the school districts to see if there's any interest in any of the books. Sometimes all the books may not be picked up, but there may be a few. But you keep going from maybe district to district and presenting this and maybe somebody else's book will be picked another time for whatever reason. Sometimes maybe the school might pick it up for an author visit maybe the school will pick it up as part of their curriculum maybe they may have like a, a culture day or something and they may showcase your book so we never know where uh, it can be but i also agree that there is very it's very powerful um when we come together um there's that that african proverb um oh gosh how come i am forgetting it how can i blank on it is it if you want to go if you if you want to go fast, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Yeah, so yes, yeah. we may all be experiencing our own success or whatever the case may be, but to go further, uh, going together it is more powerful. So it's something I'd have to think about, but it's something I've been thinking about lately is how can we all come together? Um, I think also just, you know, casually sharing tips reviewing each other's books for example um before they go out like before they go out or at an early stage especially those that have been successful um reviewing others books and letting them know the process that they've taken maybe to be successful even if the person does charge because as you're saying it is uh, partially a, a business part of it is a business and so that person may say i'm going to do a seminar i'm charging everybody you know 30 dollars or 20 dollars um for the seminar please join me we should get offended that the person is charging or anything of that sort and we should all join to hear the the, the, the steps the process that the person um, took to get to where they got to and see how that can help us as individual writers as well and so i think there's ways to come together it's something we we, we need to discuss and think of think about i think i i like that you said people shouldn't get offended when people charge i think yeah there's this lady i found on facebook and she was saying she gets something about people sending in their book covers i think she charges what ten dollars 
So I had sent yes. it, yes, my two book covers. So I thought she was going to do something with it. And in the end, all I just saw was she just put the book cover and posted it on her page. And I'm like, okay. But at least it gets the book out there. Somebody is going to see it from there. Somebody is going to read it from there. How I have started to, I started to think about it differently. I know I contacted an author one time and I asked her a question about, I think, uh, Kickstarter or something. Like, did she use Kickstarter or not? And what was her experience? And then she sent me a link and said, okay, basically, if you want to know, I can, I don't mind telling you, I, I can speak to you, but she sent me a link and then she was charging like maybe, I don't know, 30 or $40 an hour to speak with her. Um, for that question and honestly at that time I didn't take offense because one day we too want to be in that spot, in that spot yes. she has done very well she's in Target she's in different places at Walmart all over always getting speaking engagements and one day we will want to be in that spot if I don't want to do it no problem I don't need to do I don't need to go any further and buy it um and I just said to myself, one day you want to be there. You yes. want to be able to charge for your advice or for your services. Yes. Believe in charging for absolutely everything. I mentor students all the time, even among the, the, the midst of my busy schedule. And I don't charge them for anything. Like, oh I don't God. feel like every. I don't think that every single thing needs to be charged for because I believe and I have seen definitely that sometimes out of doing a, a good or out of doing things, bigger things come out of it. And I've seen that several times. At least that has been my experience. Um, but also we must not get offended by the fact that people charge because every little thing, even creating a flyer, sometimes it can take an hour or two hours. It's time. time that can be spent doing so, yeah, doing other things. So I have come to understand it. I may not always say, yes, okay, I'm going to pay because I may not have the funds. Um, like right now, for example, uh, there is a, a someone who is charging for like um, promoting my for promoting books, and unfortunately, it was like three hundred fifty dollars, and I couldn't I couldn't pay right now. Like I just can't. I spent so much in, into the book that I decided, and I weighed my options. Where do I want to put the money that I do have for marketing and things? And I chose not to do it that way. But you know, I'm not going to go and blast her or criticize her or anything because that is the way that she's making money. That is the way she's bringing in a an extra source of income, or that may be her primary job. And you know, we all want that one day for the most part, most of us want that. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's okay. Um, I just don't believe in charging for absolutely every little thing. That's just yeah. me. So what are the challenges you encountered while trying to get, while trying to write, write your book and while trying to publish? What are some of the challenges you encountered? I really think that the biggest challenge I have had is time. I don't have a lot of time because I do work uh, full time as well, nine to the five, nine to six, and then I also have three small children, and then I have a lot of other responsibilities. I'm a Sunday school teacher, I mentor students, I speak at high schools and things about uh, my my former career, like you know, just my experiences and lessons learned to them. I do a lot of things, um, you know, <laughs> and. It's just time. And before starting the book, I actually let go of some things. I was on the board of two organizations and I let those go um, because I thought I needed more time. But somehow I've still been attracting more things. As, even though I let <laughs> some things I look, even though I've let some things go. No, I understand. Somebody, the other day somebody asked me to write a letter to um a letter to somebody for them. So I have to work on that. Like, you know, so I was always pulling myself into different things so time has been the biggest factor the second part is marketing uh, marketing is very tricky i'm actually good at uh, connecting with people but marketing really takes time and marketing is a huge part of the publishing industry because if you don't get your book out there and you don't get it out beyond your family and friends you're not going to recoup the cost that you have invested and people and more so people are not going to know about it one of the biggest things I want for my book is access I want to increase access I want this book to be all over the world not for the 
purpose of profit making, but because I feel that these are stories that need to be told and that different people need to be to hear all over the world. Um, and I've been seeing my book on some Swedish website. Um, and I think a Dutch website as well that's being sold and things. And so I'm glad to see that. And I want to see more of, of that. So time and marketing have been um, the, the, the biggest challenges and more so the marketing because it requires more investment of money. It also requires um, more time. Um, you really need to take time to research who you're marketing to, um, write letters, and make phone calls, and so forth. And not everything is going to be a yes. There's going to be several no's, and you have to keep going to try to get the book out there. And so, someone I saw somebody put on Facebook, "Oh, we spend more time as you know, uh, independent independent publishers. We spend more time um, marketing than we do writing." And that 90% of our work is uh, is marketing, and the other 10% is just the rest of the publishing process. Oh yeah, that's, so, that's yeah. very true. So did you did you publish through Amazon? Yeah, so I um, started my own company. Uh, it's a DBA, and it's called Golden Coco Books. So it's published under there, and it's and it's on Amazon. So I uploaded it onto Amazon. Um, I uploaded it into Amazon, and then Amazon, you know, prints. And then sends it sends it off as people request the, their copy. Okay, so I, I will give you this tip free of charge for a broader reach. You can also use Ingram Spark. I'm using so, them. Yes, use Ingram Spark for for the hard copies. Hard cover. Mm -hmm. Hard Spark has a wider reach. Yeah. It has a very wide reach, and trust me, it feels good just to hold the hard copy cover of your book. <laughs> They're just something. That's so yeah, that's what I did, and that is why we're seeing that online websites in Sweden and yes. uh, uh, yes. I guess the Netherlands, yes, are are picking up the book. I think South Africa are picking up the book and, and publishing on it, or advertising on their website for people to purchase. So that is what I did, and yes, the reach is important reach as well to important. me. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. I like the glossary. I like the glossary at the back. I think that this is very very important where yes. you put the, the pronunciation of the names and the explanation of because i realized that some people just read they don't take out time they don't they don't make the effort to do a little yeah they don't make that effort to do what advice do you have for authors interested in writing what advice do you have for them um not to well the first thing i say is have a vision of what you want to see at the end of the process. I say that because it has it's taken me January will be two years since I started the process of writing the book and I just released it in November. But I had a vision that I wanted this to be a book that could be comparable to what you see in the bookstore, what you see from traditional publishers. And I'm quite satisfied and happy with the end result of it, especially the ones from my um, from my site. You know, I I'm really 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 happy with how they look and the professionalism of it, and basically just to take your time because I it's not. I can't oh, see sorry. it. Yes. So this is the this is the hardcover version. Good. You see, there's a difference. You see? Yes. There's something about that hardcover version. They just yeah. This is the hardcover version of the book. Um, and to take your time because this is a learning process, <laughs> a big learning process. And the third thing is to learn from others because I'll be honest with you, about ninety percent of this journey, I learn from other people by watching them by talking to them, by paying for some cl classes or courses with some authors, consultants, to understand the process, to understand the business um, of this. And that's how I'm able to come up with this product. It went through professional editing. It went through two designers. Um, it's gone through a lot. Uh, gone th I've gone through a lot okay. to get here. Uh, and to get to this point, to have the product that we see in front of us. Um, so it takes time. And so you should have a vision of what you want uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the author community is quite uh, always 
welcoming and willing to share information um, with the author community where did you print your books oh i'll dm you or just put they'll put it up on on facebook or whatever oh how much did it cost you well ten dollars you know i i i have learned so much from others i even uh, on instagram there was a girl who was traditionally published I, i didn't know her i think i i had commented on her book like once or twice and then i was on the call with her she lives in canada i spoke to her for a good one hour she told me everything from beginning to end really? one hour she kept I talking talking to her I was talking to her she was talking 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 like we were like best friends and she just helped me so much and ever since we have both supported each other in tremendous ways yeah and so you know yeah, yeah I mean, we always share yeah. each other's content we're always cheering each other on and you really? can just tell when there's an event or something happening she'll let me know you know i'm going to be including her in some things that i'm going to be doing later and so she traditionally published um but she purchased, she's one of the first people to have purchased my book. You know, she, we just try to support each other. My children also have her book. And so, you know, I've learned so much from other people. And so I'm definitely grateful um, for all those that have been willing to share and to also, you know, push me along and help me as well. Okay. Thank you so, so much, Erica. So for people who want to buy copies of your book, where can they find your books? Okay, so you can find the book on my website, which is www.ericaasante.com, but you can also find it on Amazon and wherever you do buy it. It's also at barnesandnobles.com. It's also at walmart.com. Um, and then um, wherever you buy the book, um, people should feel free to leave a review on Amazon. You can leave a review whether you purchase from Amazon or on her. And so that would be very helpful. That boosts the book and helps it to become more visible to um, to the general public. I think that's very important. People underestimate the power of review of book review. Oh, it's powerful. Yeah. People have so much going on and then they they forget and they just don't know. I don't think that people understand the the value and the importance of it. But you know, some people will not buy a book with with no reviews or yeah. very few reviews and so a lot of people count on reviews to to help them to make a purchase. It influences um uh, people's purchases greatly actually. Uh, and so, yeah. And I mean, I never tell people what review to leave. I just say, please leave a review. Whatever review that is, I mean, uh, you cannot control them. So, for me, I, I believe. For me, I believe in leaving helpful reviews because, like this one, now, I'm still going to go re- leave a review because I wanted to oh, talk to you today before. Yeah, I believe in leaving helpful reviews because there are some books I look at and before I buy, I like to go. I, I like to read the reviews to have an idea. But I think this one, I didn't even read a review. I just saw it and I went, ah, parents of me can take for sure. Then I check on the I'll support her. That's fine. So I would just like to say a very big thank you to you for making our time to join the Melanin Jolly Project conversations with me. Okay. Thank you. thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice thank day. You.